Um, Madam Chair, could I ask, um, maybe m most of the questions have been asked. Uh, Mr. Ratner, if I could follow up on the mandate uh, question. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I think it was your testimony, or sir, it might have been yours uh, from Coca-Cola, uh, talking about the direct cost of a mandate. I understand the direct cost of a mandate, but the indirect cost of, man of a mandate bodes in many studies a real benefit to, not directly to your cost, but to the nation's cost for health care. So how do we take that on board when one-fifth of all uninsured in America earn more than $50,000 or above? Generally, the youth of America that have a great job, don't bother spend a couple thousand bucks out there for health insurance. They're in, a, they're in a car accident, and now we have to take care of the TBI with the nation's money, which basically taxes you anyway. How do you measure the days off of your sick person, sir, down there? That, yeah, you've got 10 employees, you don't want to raise another one, but you've got to give them some sick leave, you know. But generally, you know, but you lose that. And there's a lot of studies that show that mandating, I'm not, let's just say it's the Massachusetts health care plan way. I think that you talked about, you're from Massachusetts, correct? Um, that in the social cost, and I don't mean goodness, I just mean as a business, that mandating that everyone is involved drives the risk down for those pools when the healthy are in it as well as unhealthy. And by mandating that everybody's in it, people actually go in for your preventive care. For example, the unemployed, the woman who was testifying today on the unemployed, self-employed, I read her testimony, is she here? Was that you? Yeah. I mean, you didn't go in for some preventive care, or I guess you went in and then they switched it on you and pregnant. I'm, I do have insurance. Well, there's one woman here, I, I can't remember who it was, had had testimony. Well, I, had, I had preventative care that I went in for, and I got a bill after the fact. But let, let me then get back. I probably misread. Um, my question, I guess, is why not then mandate if we all benefit from it? Well, that's the problem. We don't all benefit from it. If, if uh, I was sitting here, and I'm from Massachusetts, and it's mandated, and I said to you, you know what, guys? My premiums dropped 20%. Everyone's got coverage. Everyone's healthy. Let's go for it. But that didn't happen. But the Urban Institute study last June said that the Massachusetts health care plan seems to be working. Yes, it's costing a bit more, but uh, so is doing nothing. Probably the premiums would have gone up even more than what Massachusetts tried to do. Uh, and, and so my question is, overall, when you take direct and indirect costs, mandates, close a look at mandating it, and I'm not saying single payer at all, I'm not a single payer type, appear to say that we all benefit as a nation with greater savings than if we don't mandate. You know, I guess the devil's in the details, which is what everyone is struggling here with. If it came out and, and you know, again, if the rates had dropped, and if uh, her small her business with with two employees was paying the playing field was leveled, and she was paying the same as the guy with two hundred people, and everything was level, and all premiums were level, I don't know how much of an argument you would get from me. But the problem is getting all that stuff to work with it. And here here's the other problem: we keep hearing that the small business, the entrepreneur, is the backbone of the country. It's so out of whack that every time you add one of these costs to these micro businesses, you just literally cripple them. So if you came to me and said, listen, we're going to have this mandate, but there's going to be a tax credit for the micro businesses, yeah. um, and, and we're going to level that out so the cost doesn't cripple them. That's what I'm afraid of. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I think that how we do this, I mean, it just seems that so many people's testimony, I'm sorry I had another hearing. Um, in Pakistan, but it just seemed to me, as you said, it's how the mandate is done. Um, because there seems such good in getting, you know, those people who are healthy and uninsured into the risk premium pools. My second question, though, if I could ask one more, is um, how do you, I'm very attracted to the idea of pooling. You know, Massachusetts kind of goes head off. And the chairwoman has the Choice Act, but that's kind of more risk uh, retention, uh, as I believe her act does. 
So, and one of you testified on that, or has it in a written testimony, how do you compare risk retention through an associate cooperative versus these, uh, what I found also attractive, which at least as it was supposed to have been done, this quasi-government connector that actually, it, with a mandate, then puts them in the same 20 uh, insurance plans, theoretically, that Congress members have access to the federal government. Is one better than the other of that pooling of I can, I can speak. I'm not sure I can speak to superiority. I have an opinion on the superiority. I can speak to what you can do with pooling, because as I indicated in my testimony, that may be maybe my testimony you were referring to. We have a pooled, captive-based program with our liability insurance. It works beautifully. We've got large members. We got small members in it. Uh, we put. We take. 100% of the risk or nearly 100% of the risk even though there's an admitted insurer that writes a paper but we do the reinsurance we take the pro we take the money from the with that goes into the loss fund and invest it we have active um, claims management people we have active loss control programs to, to reduce the cost we're totally motivated to reduce the total cost and we work very hard on that sharing best practices and that program delivers we've been at it for five years we deliver about a 25 percent uh, reduction to our, our, our members that participate in that so it, it, it works beautifully in the liability area, and I don't know why it wouldn't work just as well in, right. the, in the health insurance. Uh, Can I make one last statement, Madam Chair? My prejudice, so you know, is um, I, you know, I was in the military up to about three years ago, and only about 23% of high school graduates uh, every year can qualify to go in the U.S. military because physically and health-wise, they don't qualify. So. To some degree, we can get healthy kids, but once you're in it, there is this mandate that everybody and their families are covered. Now, it's a different health care plan. All that said, I mean, we don't deploy overseas until everybody has 99% dental readiness. <laughs> Sounds funny, but in a sense, we are really a healthy force out there with this. And then I was quite struck you know, when my daughter had a brain tumor and I needed to get out and take care of that by... Um, the failure to have transparency, first off, and who's the right doctor to go to, which is why fee-for-service has to change uh, on, in Medicare and all. I mean, I love Medicare. Number two, that I could go to an 11-month war, and my, month, my mind was strictly on the mission because I knew my family was there and I wasn't away from work for this nation's work at the time. And so to my mind, that model, why I understand TRICARE is different and all, bodes to me that if cost for econo economy overall is to be something, having healthy preventive care with everybody involved, the healthy as well as the unhealthy, and how you do that seems to me is one of the most critical pieces that we can have to have the most proficient economy we have. Because you do have people who wouldn't get sick if they had the preventive care and items like that and risk go down. I'm sorry to go on, but I think this is one of the most important hearings that we could have. Thank you, and I'm sorry I was late.